Welcome to October's Coastal Gardening. You know, the cooler weather, lots of new tasks, lots of things going on in the garden this time of year. Later in the show, we'll bring you some kitchen tips with Chantel Welker. The middle segment this time is going to be about fire ants, and you'll see a lot of fire ant mounds showing up this time of year. To start with today, we're in the rose garden. When you think about roses, you think, eh, not the greatest place to grow roses here in southeastern North Carolina. But one thing about it, this time of year is great for roses. And if you do have a rose garden like we have here at the Arboretum, you'll see them doing extremely well in the cooler temperatures and the cooler nights of fall. You see these are flushing out incredible amounts of new growth, lots of buds set. So it's important that you continue to take care of your roses on into the later part of the season or else the diseases and the insects that always attack roses are gonna continue to, to be a problem. So the fungicide, insecticide things are really necessary going in and doing some deadheading, really necessary to keep that going. Probably don't need to do a lot of fertilizing on your rose garden this time of year, especially if you put a control release fertilizer out earlier. But you should really enjoy your roses this time of year because the, the temperatures, the conditions, much better than during the summer. When you think about roses, you think about things like black spot, a very common fungal disease. And there are lots of diseases out there right now on the old foliage of trees. You see this Ascochyta blight on flowering dogwood, the little Cercosporas and Septorias, all these fungal leaf spots that are really not much of an issue. Keep in mind plants, especially deciduous plants like the dogwood, they've done about all they're going to do as far as growing and making carbohydrate for this growing season. A little bit of leaf spot, a little early leaf drop, not a big deal for the plants. So you see a little leaf spot, probably the best thing to do is just ignore it. It's not really worth spraying the fungicide. Now that's not true about the roses. You need to keep those going as long as you've got the temperatures to keep uh, bud set and new growth uh, continuing. Now one of the tasks that is right for this time of year is overseeding your warm season grasses. Now keep in mind, overseeding is not something you typically would want to do to Centipede and St. Augustine. They don't tolerate the mechanical damage and the, the competition from the ryegrass like the others like Zoysia and Bermuda do. So if you don't have to overseed, don't do it. And if you don't really like messing in the lawn, that keeps you from having to mow grass all, all the winter, so that's even better. But if you really just don't like having brown grass in the wintertime, you can overseed with ryegrass. Now, annual ryegrass is the cheapest and the easiest to find. It's also going to give you the least or, or the poorest quality of turf. You do have what's called intermediate ryegrass and perennial ryegrasses, which most of the professional situations like athletic fields, golf courses use. We're going to be using a perennial ryegrass blend here, but just a couple of things to keep in mind other than not doing it to Centipede in St. Augustine. If you have a fairly open turf, all you really need to do is just kind of mow it closely. And that way you can get that seed to drop down to the soil. Keep in mind, if you have a very dense turf, you're gonna to have to do something, a verticutting, an aeration, something to get that seed to move to the soil because if it's held up by the other grass, you're not gonna get germination. So getting that seed down to the soil line is very important. If you do have the open turf, like I said, maybe the thing of just mowing it closely, then taking a rake and just turning it backwards and just knocking the seed down to the soil works, verticutting or aeration on the other. Now, some people wonder about exactly how to do this. One of the best ways to do it is with a rotary spreader. A lot of people want to use a drop spreader. They don't always work so well because they tend to line the seed out so you don't get a nice broadcast application. The negative of the broadcast applicator is it throws the seed into the beds in places you don't want it to come up. And it always seems like the seeds germinate twice there. So what a lot of people do is broadcast the center areas and then maybe take a, a drop spreader and do the edges or just take a bucket and just scatter it out with your hand so you don't get so much of the seed out into places you really don't want. The other thing to think about is how much Typically, it's going to take at least 10 pounds of seed per thousand square feet to give you any kind of decent turf. It's going to be better to go 12 to 15 pounds if you have the warm season grass underneath that will tolerate it, the zoysia and the Bermuda. If you're overseeding centipede St. Augustine, you'd probably be much better off to keep those seeding rates a little lower. But the good thing about this is if you put that out now in October, you'll get fairly quick germination of the ryegrass and you'll have nice green grass all through the winter. Now the other thing will come in the transition in the spring when the other grasses begin to green up, 
You're going to want to try to move the ryegrass on out, but maybe we'll talk to you about that next spring when it's the right timing. One last tip for you, if you do have things like junipers, like this Hollywood juniper here, this kind of weather condition, perfect for the cool weather spider mites. Spruce spider mite, which is attacking the juniper, also attacks Leyland cypress and a lot of other conifers. And you also get southern red mite, which attacks azaleas, camellias, all kinds of different plants. Look for them, shake the foliage over something light colored like this to see the little dots moving around. If you do have spider mites, look for a miticide, or if you're trying to stay away from traditional pesticides, horticultural oil does a reasonably good job of knocking the cool weather spider mite populations down. But they are out right now, so check your plants. You'll lose that chlorophyll, so you'll get kind of a sheen that's not quite dark green, just like this juniper looks here. Well, I hope those tips are helpful. When we come back from the break, we're gonna to talk to you about fire ants and all that mound building they're doing this time of year. Visit the area's finest artwork set amidst some of the most colorful landscapes of the Cape Fear region at Art in the Arboretum, October 6th and 7th. Take in the fall splendor while browsing all types of art, from painting and photography to glass and metalwork. New this year, a children's art area managed by the Children's Museum of Wilmington. Admission is just $5 or free with your Arboretum membership. All proceeds benefit the New Hanover County Arboretum and its programs. Back to the show, we've got something that a lot of people are experiencing right now in lawns and shrub beds. Pretty significant problem, especially for pets and children and even for us adults. That is the red imported fire ant. This time of year, as the soil temperatures begin to drop and the daytime temperatures, of course, are cooler, the fire ants are going to start really building mounds. They're going to do a lot of uh, work to get ready for the coming winter. So especially on south and southwestern facing slopes, areas near electrical junction boxes, anything that warms the soil, you'll probably find red imported fire ant mounds really getting high right now. Now if you look at the ones we're here in this kind of lawn area where it's been mowed, they tend to spread the mound out much more so you're not going to get the real high mound, especially if it's being mowed fairly often and knocking it down. But they're still here and you really need to be careful, especially if you tend to be allergic to problems like this, but that could even be deadly. For most of us, it's not that bad, but it does cause a lot of painful, uh, the sting, the bite, and then of course the pustule that forms afterwards. One question we often get with red imported fire ant is how in the heck they get here? Uh, we believe they were introduced to Mobile, Alabama in ship's ballast back when they used to use soil for ballast. These are natives of South America. So that's one of the problems. When they were first were introduced, they said, well, they'll never get this far north because they don't go that far north uh, in South America. Well, unfortunately, they uh, have adapted pretty well and they cover a lot of North Carolina, not just southeastern North Carolina, but of course we've had them for a long time. So we know where they came from, but do we know really what they look like? A lot of people look at these ants and they say, well, they're not as large as I thought they were. Red imported fire ants are not large ants, but they can inflict a painful sting on you if you disturb them. So look at them, they, they almost don't look quite as red as you might think either. They're a lot of black on the body, so it's red and black, but it's not a huge ant that's gonna really impress you with its size, but it could impress you with the sting. Now we've got these things, they're in the lawn, they're in the shrub beds, they're in all these different places. What are we going to do about it? Now this is, there are a whole lot of different ways to approach red imported fire ant control. One of the best ways to do it, especially if you have a little extra time, you don't have to immediately deal with it, is to use the bait materials like this Amdro here. Amdro is one of the older products that we've had around and there are many, many other bait products out there, Extinguish and Affirm and many other brand names. But they're all similar, they're all, not all the same chemical, but they're all similar in that they're formulated on some kind of grain base, in this case corn. So what you're trying to do with bait materials is to, especially individual mound treatment, is to place the stuff where they will forage for it and take it back into the, the mound, the colony, and feed it to the queen and to the rest of the ants. So a couple of things to keep in mind with baits. One is don't put it on top of the mound, put it around the perimeter. 
fire ants are very sensitive to any kind of threat. If you put your finger in the mound a little bit and disturb it, you'll see them boil out of the ground. If you stick a flag on it to mark it, that will often disturb them enough to make them move the mound. So you don't want to disturb them. As one guy said, sneak up on them, put the bait material around the perimeter, do it at a time when you don't expect rainfall immediately and your irrigation system, if that's an irrigated area, is not set to run immediately because you want that uh, grain to stay dry and for them to have an opportunity to forage for it and take it back into the mound. Now, of course, with the bait products, you're not going to get immediate control. It's going to take a while, but it is very effective, especially if you just have a few mounds here and there and you can treat them individually. Now, some people will do a broadcast treatment. If you have places like parks and, and the backyards where the kids are playing, you have animals, it might make more sense rather than doing individual mound treatments to do a broadcast application of an insecticide. For many years, Fipronil was sold as over and out to the homeowner trade, and you could go anywhere and buy that product. Uh, that product, the good thing about Fipronil is that it hangs around for a long time, doesn't break down real quickly, so you could do one application and it would control the fire ants and often control mole crickets for up to 10, 12 months. Unfortunately, the homeowner label for Fipronil was taken away. So you're not gonna be able to find that product. You will find over and out, but it's not Fipronil. It's actually Bifenthrin, which is a good insecticide, but it doesn't hang around like Fipronil. So you're not gonna get quite as good a control from the over and out product now with Bifenthrin like you would have with the Fipronil. Now, if you want the Fipronil, you can get it. Professionals use a product called Top Choice. You have to have a license to, to deal with Top Choice, so you'd have to pay someone to do it. But you do get long-term control. Might be a little pricey, but if you factor it out over a whole year's control, maybe it makes sense. And it's a heck of a lot easier than having to go out and deal with it all the time. So a lot of the contact insecticide products that you find, you'll find Asaphate, the old Orthene product, the Bifenthin that we mentioned, the Lambda Cyfluthrin, another synthetic pyrethroid. They are not going to give you as good a control as we mentioned. The other thing about them is you can't get the product to the whole colony of ants. So a lot of times with the contact insecticides, even if you drench them well and do everything right, all you do is end up scattering the colony and they end up setting up shop in three or four locations around the original colony. So if you can deal with the Fipronil, that's probably your best control. The baits for individual mounds are certainly the best way to go, even though it's not a quick control. The other thing you'll hear, you'll hear a lot of old wives tales about controlling fire ants. You'll hear things like uh, you put uh, carbonated kind of beverages on them. You'll hear things about uh, corn starch and all kinds of other things. And generally, those products don't work. There are some people using something like steam uh, again, a fairly uh, difficult way to go, but you know, if you can put 160 degree steam out there, you can kill the fire ants. But again, the problem is getting to all of them and getting to the queen, because as long as that queen or queens, because some of the colonies have multiples, survive, the colony is going to survive. After the break, we're going to finish up the show with Chantel Welkin, the first in a series of canning segments, this one on apples. Visit the area's finest artwork set amidst some of the most colorful landscapes of the Cape Fear region at Art in the Arboretum, October 6th and 7th. Take in the fall splendor while browsing all types of art, from painting and photography to glass and metalwork. New this year, a children's art area managed by the Children's Museum of Wilmington. Admission is just $5 or free with your Arboretum membership. All proceeds benefit the New Hanover County Arboretum and its programs. Welcome back to the Coastal Gardener. I'm Chantel Welker, Family and Consumer Sciences Agent here at Cooperative Extension at the Arboretum. Did you know October is Apple Month, National Apple Month? 
celebrating all month long the nutritional benefits of eating apples. And here in North Carolina, October through December is uh, apple season. So today I'm going to show you how to make applesauce and can it safely. Applesauce only takes a few ingredients. We've got apples and some fruit fresh. Uh, fruit fresh is also known as ascorbic acid. It's to help prevent the apples from browning once you cut them. You don't have to use it, but if you're using a lot of apples for your applesauce, then you want to have a bowl of water with ascorbic acid, a gallon of water with a teaspoon of this fruit fresh in there, and you can put all your apples in there that have already been peeled and keep them from browning, as I've done here um, with about 10 cups of apples. And all you do is pick a sweet, juicy apple. It's preference on what your taste is. Uh, for myself, I picked Fuji apples. And all you have to do is wash them, and then you're going to peel it. Now you might ask, well, are apples still going to be that nutritious once you cut the peel off? Because a lot of nutrients are in that, ap in that apple peel. But um, when you have applesauce, you've got a bunch of apples condensed down into this sauce that um, because it's so dense, it does still have a lot of the nutrient benefits, even without their peels. So you're still going to get a lot of fiber, potassium, and some calcium in with the applesauce, even without that peel. So after you peel it, you can core it now, or you can slice it and then cut out the core. You can either have it or quarter it, whatever you prefer. I like to do a little bit smaller so it cooks up faster. I'm just going to cut that core out. And then depending on if you don't want to waste a lot of apple, try to get as close to that core as possible so you can get more applesauce out of it. And then I've already got my apples here that I've prepared. So I'm just going to pour them into this pot. I've got a little bit of that juice from the ascorbic acid and water solution in there, so we want to try to keep that out of there. Then you're going to add a little bit of water, about a half a cup of water, just to keep it from burning when it's cooking. Then turn it on. You want to heat it up quickly. Let's turn it on high heat. I'm just going to stir it around a little bit. Put the lid on. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how uh, soft the apples are when you start. So if you're starting with a pretty ripe apple, it won't take as long. It just depends on what variety you're using and how fresh it is. So the apples have been in here about 20 to 25 minutes. Fuji's are a little bit firmer, so it takes a little bit longer for these ones to cook. But I'm going to pull them out of here and push them through a strainer to get these chunks out of here. This is an optional part. If you like your applesauce chunky, you don't have to do this. And depending on the apple, you might not need to do it. So just put it in the strainer. Start squeezing it through. You can see it's starting to come out on this other side. And just continue to do this with all your apples until you got your paste. And then once we're done with that, put it back in the pot. All right, I've finished pushing the apples through the strainer. I'm going to pour them back in the pot, bring it to a boil. And if you're thinking you don't want to use a strainer, it's too labor intensive, you can put it through a food processor 
you know, save you a little bit of time. Just depends on what you want to do. Can give you a little workout if you do the strainer. So I'm gonna bring it to a boil. Just stir it frequently to make sure it doesn't burn on the bottom of the pot. Should be a nice consistency in there. Like I said, if there's some chunks in there, it doesn't really matter. It's just personal preference when you're eating it. If if you don't mind the chunks or if you want it smooth, it's up to you. Got it boiling, so I'm just gonna put my thermometer in here. Should come to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, we've got it up to temperature. So next step is ladling it into the jars. Now, depending on what you're canning, you may or may not need to sterilize your jars. For this recipe, it calls for processing the jars for 15 minutes. So anything over 10 minutes, you don't have to sterilize the jars in advance. You just want to keep them hot so that when you put them in here full, they're not going to crack on you or damage the jars. So I've just had these sitting here in my water. I'm just going to pour that out. And with this recipe, for a pint-sized jar, uh, about a half, a pound and a half of apples should fill that jar. So I've just got two here today. Depending on how many apples you've got, you could fit many more in here, or you could even use a quart-sized jar. But for this recipe, it's a pint-sized jar, and it's going to process for 15 minutes. You want to keep this applesauce boiling while you're putting it into your jars. I've got this fancy tool. It just helps it keep it off the rim of the jar. You don't have to have it. It just makes it easier to keep your jar clean so that your lid will seal. And it's going to call for half inch head space. Just pour that right in there. And once you do this enough, you can kind of eyeball it, but I've got a fancy tool that's called a headspace measurer to make sure I've got that exact space because that's going to be what helps the applesauce preserve correctly. And be careful, your jar is going to be really hot. Just kind of shake it down in there. This is my headspace measurer. Make sure it's nice and even in there. And then it's got markings on it. I'm going to go to the half inch marking. And I've got too much applesauce in there, so that's okay. I just need to spoon a little bit out of there. The key is just once you get that correct headspace to make sure the rim is nice and clean. So I'm going to measure that again. And it's right at a half inch. And if I bring it all the way around, it's half inch. So now I have my lids in here that have been simmering. And that's because they have this little rubber ring around here and you want to warm it up so that when you're processing it, it's going to suction to the jar. Um, so I've got that, but first I want to just wipe off this rim. Make sure it's nice and clean because that's what your, your lid's going to connect directly to. And if you've got food particles under there, it can make that seal not quite tight enough. And I'm going to use the other end of this measurer and remove the air bubbles out of the jar. Just scrape it around the inside of the jar. And you typically want to use something plastic um, because if you use a butter knife, you can scratch that jar and that's going to make it um, damage faster. So I've just got my lid here. I'm going to put that straight on. Use the band fingertip tight. You don't want to crank on it because then that's going to damage that rubber seal I showed you. And then grab your nifty little jar 
tool, grab below the ring, because otherwise it can move that lid on there. And then you just lift it straight across and over. You don't want it to tilt. Put it straight down in. You should have a rack in this pan. To keep it from touching the bottom of the pot. And then you need to bring the water to a boil. It's going to be a brisk boil for a boiling water bath. And once it comes to a boil, that's when you're going to start your timer. So I'm just going to put this lid on here and bring it to a boil. All right, it's been in here for 15 minutes. So now I'm just going to turn the burner off, take the lid off. Let it sit and settle for five minutes, and after five minutes, I can take it out and let it sit and cool for 12 to 24 hours. So I'm just going to reset this for five minutes, and then it'll be ready. All right, it's been in here for five minutes. Now I'm going to just take it out gently. Be careful when you're pulling it out. You don't want it to be tilting all around and different